Здравствуйте, ребят, садитесь, пожалуйста. Ребят, пожалуйста, дверь закройте за, за собой. Спасибо. Левая сторона тоже дверь прикройте, пожалуйста. Спасибо. Ну, дорогие друзья, я буду выступать по-русски. Мне доставляет огромное в общем, удовольствие открывать нашу сегодняшнюю лекцию. Лекцию, в общем-то, которую проведет известный ученый, известный экономист Джеймс Гелбрейт посвященная во многом работам его отца. Я не буду долго говорить. Я скажу только вот из таких собственных воспоминаний. Вы знаете, когда я был тоже студентом, это первый, второй курс, в общем-то, в очень многом я как раз тоже опирался на работы, на работы профессора Гелбрейта. И вы знаете, более того, когда я, в общем-то, дома обсуждал вот сегодняшнее приятие, оказывается, мои родители, которые тоже заканчивали МЭО, тоже, в общем-то, во многом учились, в том числе на работах. Я, поэтому те из вас, кто не знаком с ними, я настоятельно рекомендую ребят знакомиться, потому что во-первых, они написаны совершенно уникальным стилем. Читается это не как какая-то, знаете, такая тяжелые экономические статьи или какие-то в общем-то сложные, сложные какие-то там измышления, выкладки. Читается это очень легко. Работы там, начиная с 50-х годов, в принципе, не потеряли своей актуальности в общем -то, не на толику, что, конечно, признак, в общем-то, гениальности да, в известной степени. И поэтому, в общем, мне доставляет огромное удовольствие представить сегодняшнего нашего лектора. И, но прежде чем передать слово, хотелось бы также передать слово Роману Владимиру Евгеньевичу, генеральному директору Фонда исторической перспективы, который также немножко расскажет. И с вашего позволения, коллеги, я вынужден бежать на, на занятия, вот так что я вас оставляю. Ну, спасибо. спасибо. Значит, друзья мои, также у нас э, есть 20 экземпляров книг, как раз посвященных тематике сегодняшнего выступления. Поэтому, как вы знаете, наверное, я так понимаю, что большинство из вас и студентов все-таки факультета МЭО, хотя, наверное, не только. Э, я напоминаю, что 7 декабря у нас будет день, посвященный 60-летию нашего факультета. Во-первых, хотелось бы еще раз всех пригласить вас на этот день на празднование. И часть из этих книг мы, конечно, презентуем вам поскольку мы в общем, планируем проведение ряда конкурсов для студентов там, на лучшую следовательскую работу там, ну и так далее. Мы все об этом оповестим позже, сейчас не буду время тратить. Так что вот я думаю, это будет совершенно замечательная и уникальная возможность. Спасибо. Спасибо. Коллеги, добрый день. Мне не меньшее удовольствие доставляет, чем вашему декану, предварить лекцию профессора Джеймса Кеннета Гелбрейта, ученого, работа которого широко известна в академическом мире, давно стали учебными пособиями для студентов американских, да и не только американских университетов, а еще и потому, что, как вы понимаете, Джеймс является сыном Джона Кеннета Гелбрейта, выдающегося ученого прошлого века, который не только работа которого не только совершили переворот в экономической науке, но и оказали огромное влияние на людей моего поколения. Вот лично я прекрасно помню книжку с синей обложкой «New Industrial State», тогда еще ДСП, которая произвела на меня и на моих сокурсников огромные впечатления. Когда из цепочки совершенно парадоксальных, неожиданных, умозаключений, наблюдений, выводов, вдруг рождается абсолютно ясная и четкая картинка, объясняющая процессы в современной мировой экономике, в экономике ведущих западных стран. Ну вот поэтому, наверное, что когда господин Нагаев, который будет сегодня вам презентовать эту книжку, пришел к нам в фонд исторической перспективы с идеей нового проекта, а именно популяризации наследия Джона Кеннета Гелбрита, уговаривать нас долго не пришлось. Проект этот предусматривает издание неопубликованных на русском работ Джона Кеннета Гелбрита. Вот лично я очень бы хотел издать его переписку с президентом Кеннеди, он был советником Кеннеди, и не только его, уникальная совершенно книжка. И во время пребывания Джеймса в Москве мы будем говорить о том, насколько это возможно. И в 
Вторая часть этого проекта – это лекции, которые Джеймс, профессор Джеймс Гелбрейт любезно согласился прочитать в Москве, в ведущих московских университетах. Это МГИМО, МГУ, РГГУ. Ну и я лично очень рад, что первые лекции из этого цикла состоится в моем родном вузе. Так что получайте удовольствие и готовьте вопросы, которые вы будете задавать профессору. Спасибо большое. Дин Пешков, директор Романов, мои друзья, это большое удовольствие для меня быть здесь, в Индигимо, который я был сказал, был называется доктор Хенри Киссинджер, как Харвард России. Я являюсь студентом Харварда, и это возможно, что доктор Киссинджер имеет более favorable view of that institution, than I do. Uh, in any event, knowing a little about the relationship between that institution and this country, I would advise you, I would hope that you will not take the comparison too seriously. But I am here to speak about a Harvard professor, uh, my father, who was, according to um, President Derek Bach of Harvard, uh, the words that he spoke at the memorial service in 2006, the longest serving professor uh, in the history of that institution, if you count the full span from his first arrival there in 1934 until his passing in 2006. Uh, I want to um, speak to you today about the central period uh, in my father's life, about the moment roughly from 1952 into the late 1960s, when uh, he emerged as one of the dominant, perhaps the dominant, certainly American economist, and one of the most dominant economic voices uh, in the world at that time. This is part of a sequence of lectures uh, that I will be giving uh, in Moscow over the course of the next few days. The one I'm giving you, although I'm giving it first, is actually the second lecture. And I'll give one more in a few days on the aftermath of the, uh, my father's uh, uh, vision and over the last 50 years, and one on the formation of his ideas, uh, and I'll give on, I guess, Thursday. Uh, but today I want to focus on the heart of the matter. I will say a few words about his background, about where, uh, about the environment from which he emerged. Uh, as I think it's essential to understand that uh, that he, along with many others of his time, was not primarily um, framed by intellectual forces. He was born on a farm, raised in uh, a climate of progressive North American agriculture in southern Canada, in Ontario, in the 1920s into the 1930s. Uh, he uh, pursued agricultural economics initially at Berkeley. Uh, 
joined the early New Deal, where the crisis of the agricultural economy was perhaps the central initial issue, went on and absorbed uh, the thinking of John Maynard Keynes at Cambridge in 1937, 1938, although he, Keynes was not there at the time, came back and was caught up in the practical questions of industrial mobilization and especially price control uh, in the second, uh, in the early phases, I should say, uh, of the Second World War. He was uh, a practical man. By comparison with that, his formation in academic economics was eclectic, incidental, and one might argue insubstantial. This was a great advantage. It kept his head clear and open, unfuddled by nonsense, to take a phrase from Keynes in 1929. By the late 1940s and 1950s, his reading interests were largely in areas of organization and management. Uh, figures like James Burnham, Herbert Sinem, Simon, Adolf Burl, Gardner Means. His closest friends amongst economists were people like the uh, British economists of Hungarian origin, Nicholas Kaldor and Thomas Balog, Gunnar Myrdal in Sweden, perhaps a little more distantly, people like Shigeto Suru in Japan, Stanislav Menshikov in the USSR. His closest friend at Harvard was an eminently practical Russian by the name of Vasily Leontiev, the father of input-output analysis, a graduate of the University of Petrograd, and a very delightful and amusing man who was my first economics instructor. He became, my father did, a rising celebrity in the 1950s, cultivating a sparring relationship with Milton Friedman, and later on with William F. Buckley, Jr. In politics, he maintained very close links, beginning in the 1930s with his undergraduate pupil at Winthrop House in Harvard, a congressman and later senator by the name of John F. Kennedy, and with a neighbor from Alexandria, Virginia in 1940, just outside Washington, who became by that time Senate Majority Leader by the name of Lyndon Johnson. In the 1960 campaign, after a small debacle, Senator Kennedy at one point said to him, Ken, I don't want to hear about farm policy, agricultural policy, from anyone but you, and I don't want to hear it from you either. So he had, uh, unlike Keynes, no struggle to escape. His independence from the textbooks and the dogma was complete from the beginning. And literary success, American capitalism, the great crash, the affluent society, brought him an audience that was unrivaled by any peer, and not merely in the industrial and democratic West, but in rising Japan, in Fabian India, in the Khrushchev reform period of the USSR, and even though we did not know it at the time, in Maoist China. In the United States, he was so widely read that Milton Friedman felt obliged to write books against him and eventually a television series, uh, Free to Choose. The economics profession took steps to make sure that the experience of John Kenneth Galbraith could not be repeated by anyone else, and it succeeded in this. The practical person posed a lethal threat to impractical thought. My father's rise to global fame came through five books that were published between 1952 and 1967. American Capitalism, The Great Crash of 1929, The Affluent Society, and after an interval of nearly a decade, The New Industrial State. 
The other books, other books appeared during those years, including a technical essay on price control, a theory of price control, a collection of essays called The Liberal Hour, a diary, ambassador's journal, a memoir, The Scotch, two works of satirical fiction, mainly at the State Department, at the profession of foreign policy makers. They were called The McLandris Dimension and The Triumph. They were also years of my father's main political engagement, and then included two years of diplomatic service in India. Let's see if I can make this thing now work. Oops. Uh, and the Democratic Policy Council of the 1950s to uh, the new frontier and the design of the war on poverty and the great society under Lyndon Johnson. Uh, this is a photograph of the Democratic Policy Council meeting in the late 1950s, and then my father's in the front Look, talking to President Harry Truman, who was presiding over that particular meeting. In India, from 1961 to 1963, he served President Kennedy. And there's a photograph of us at the Delhi Zoo. I'm right in the center holding the leopard cub, whose name was Jumna. You can see my father on one side of the photograph, my mother on the other. Uh, the leopard cub survived with us for about six weeks and then had to be given back to the zoo because leopards really don't make good pets. But those of you who are going into the diplomatic service, this is a sign of the kind of thing that you might have to deal with at one point or another. Um, ultimately, he became a dissident, a uh, leader of a group called Americans for Democratic Action at the moment of breach between American liberals and the Democratic president, Lyndon Johnson, over the Vietnam War. The head of a movement called Negotiations Now over Vietnam, and ultimately the campaign of Eugene McCarthy uh, for the presidency in 1968. And a bitter ending I think it's fair to say, came in that year, 1968, marked by assassinations, the police riot at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. I was there in August. The election of Richard Nixon to the presidency in November. And in this way began the strange death of American liberalism and the deepening reaction of the remaining 38 years of his life. There was a concern that he uh, evoked at practically every opportunity. And I'll read you a short passage from this, from the 1956 edition of American Capitalism. Uh, that his work, quote, would not seem very relevant when viewed from the radioactive debris that would remain after a war, even a victorious one. He was not in favor of, quote, sudden massive and very high temperature extinction, unquote. And the thought of this possibility was not very, never very far from his mind. It would be restated in the final word of his final book, The Economics of Innocent Fraud, published in 2004 when he was 94. That said, American capitalism, it's a copy of the cover, a nice sort of socialist realist um, design on that one. Uh, is about economic success, about the great success of the American industrial system in the years following the Second World War, which were years of expansive prosperity and the sustained fruits of the New Deal social and political innovations, including social security, labor rights, the minimum wage, a strong public presence at the forefront of industrial research and public investment, especially in higher education, transportation system, the irony and the pleasure of the book lay in the discomfort this success caused for business leaders and conservative economists to the former because of their ingrained adverse view of socialism and Keynesianism or of any social order that they themselves did not command. And to the latter, the economists, because the American system could never be confused or reconciled with their ideal of competitive equilibrium or the self-sufficient free market. As my father wrote in the opening passage of that book, such as the aerodynamics and wing loading of the bumblebee that in, pres in, in, in uh, theory it cannot fly, says, but it does. And, the fact that it defies the august wisdom of Isaac Newton and Orville Wright must cause the dumb 
Bumblebee a fair amount of psychological trauma. The antitrust movement, too, was nonplussed by events and circumstances, their approach plainly absurd in an economy driven by rapid development of new techniques, products, technologies, and energy sources. The phrase countervailing power, checks and balances in the economic sphere, was the practical answer. And the path between free market utopians on one side and the problematic monomania of state socialism on the other. The book captured the spirit of the moment and sold, if my memory is correct, about a quarter of a million copies. The Great Crash, 1929, was a summer's writing project in the Dartmouth Library in 1955. And it worked new threads into my father's intellectual tapestry. These threads would uh, reappear periodically in later work, in money, whence it came, where it went, in the age of uncertainty, and in a short history of financial euphoria. They dealt with the highly unstable institutions and comic follies of money and credit, with a susceptibility to ingenious fraud of capital markets and with the pompous self-regard of the powerfully self-inflated gentlemen who like to rule over all creation from Park Avenue and Wall Street. The great crash told an internal story, financial folly, through the vignette of a single episode, the crash of 1929, which was in 1955 living memory. Largely, and the story is largely taken from the newspapers of the hour. And it again teased the economists for whom financial events could never be properly causal, only they reflected deeper phenomena. The public thought otherwise. This was by far the largest seller of my father's books. And it has never been out of print except for a few months in early 1987. And it was, came back into print very rapidly right after the stock market fell by a third on October 19th of that year. I called my father that evening. It was hard to get through. Those were the days when people had phone lines in their houses, you know. Uh, and eventually, I, I got, picked up the phone. I, I said, I greeted him. He said, James, is that you? I said, yes, Dad. He said, not to worry. I've been in cash for three weeks. And there was a pause, and he said, but I'm sorry to say that the same cannot be said of your mother. But she found it difficult to sell the General Electric that her family had bought from Edison for a dollar. In 2003, I met Fidel Castro in Havana. And once he established who I was, his very first words were to me, the great crash, my favorite book. I have a copy on my night table. In 2009, after the debacle, it came right back and sold about 50,000 copies. We come now to the Affluent Society, a book of, let's see, there we are, considerable interest, uh, in part because it's been published this year in Russia for the very first time. Very interesting phenomenon, considering that my father's work was well known in Russia and the Soviet Union uh, in uh, the time that it was appearing for the first time. It's a book which has a special interest from my point of view, uh, because as you can see, it's dedicated in part uh, to me. And it was the book that will most decisively mark his place in the history of economic thought and in the literature of the mid 20th century. It is here that the phrase uh, conventional wisdom appears. Oh, there's a, how dad inscribed that particular copy to me. You can't read it, of course, that was his handwriting. It's totally illegible. Uh, but aside from love dad, it says, sorry about the edition, but it's more valuable, meaning he'd given me a first edition. So this was the practical man always thinking about the value of his presence to his children. 
Um, but it is here, oh, and I should say, a book which had resonance around the world. Uh, and in this particular instance, here's a cover, which is made of used matchsticks and shellac by three professors of economics who were imprisoned by the fascist junta in Greece in the late 1960s, after 67. And they sat in prison and they made covers for books from the prison library, and that's the one that they gave to my father afterwards. It's one of my most, in some ways, my most precious possession. It is here that the phrase conventional wisdom, you see this chapter two, the concept of the conventional wisdom, first appears here that such phrases as the revised sequence, the problem of social balance are defined here that we read of private opulence and public squalor. Amartya Sen at my father's memorial service a half century later remarked it was like reading Shakespeare. It's full of quotations. But the book's strength and importance lay in its frontal assault on the core of neoclassical economics and in setting a vast progressive agenda for decades to come, for an agenda that covered everything from human rights to women's rights to environmental uh, policy to the whole range of public and social questions that had lain aside uh, in the economics of scarcity, but that my father argued would be central to an economics of abundance. Its strength and importance lay in its frontal assault on the core of neoclassical economics, as I just said. It was not accidental. As I learned years later while giving a memorial lecture honoring the civil rights lawyers Clifford and Virginia Durr in Montgomery, Alabama, that the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. had two books with him when he composed the letter from the Birmingham jail. One was the Bible, then the other was the Affluent Society. The Affluent Society is incontestably the most accessible and most widely read general critique of neoclassical economics ever written. More arguably, it's also one of the most profound. For the affluent society cuts to the core proposition that economics is about scarcity and therefore to the bedrock assumptions of utility maximization in consumption and profit maximization in the conduct of the business firm. If you've taken an economics class on the Western model, as I suppose many of you have, those propositions are probably still very much the core of the textbook, theory. But unlike the theories of imperfect competition, Joan Robinson, Edward Chamberlain, which had been introduced in the 1930s, the affluent society was not merely a departure from the ancient dichotomy between pure competition and monopoly. It does not hold perfect competition as the ideal case. The task of policy is not to try to approximate that supposed ideal. Antitrust, the favored tool of those holding such a view, is therefore mostly irrelevant. And unlike in Keynes's general theory, a book for economists and largely misread by them, there is no full employment world in which the competitive market comes into its own, even as a special case. There is thus in the affluent society no scope for the neoclassical synthesis whose practical consequence was for decades the division of instruction into macro and micro. Again, if you've taken economics, I suppose that's something that you had to suffer through. I've often argued that Christmas exists uh, because it enables students to forget micro before they take macro or the other way around. Um, the, uh, Nor, in contrast to Schumpeter, did Galbraith describe the world as it is, a task from which Schumpeter did not shrink, only to accept it as the best one can do. In this book, The Affluent Society, the task of defining and facing problems cannot be escaped or evaded. 
The point of departure, I would argue, was Thorstein Veblen, who in 1898 characterized economic man in a phrase that I can't resist quoting, the hedonistic conception of man is that of a lightning calculator of pleasures and pains who oscillates like a homogeneous globule of desire of happiness under the impulse of stimuli that shift him about the area but leave him intact. He has neither antecedent nor consequent. He is an isolated definitive human datum in stable equilibrium except for the buffets of the impinging forces that displace him in one direction or another. Self-poised in elemental space, he spins symmetrically about his own spiritual axis until the parallelogram of forces bears down upon him, whereupon he follows the line of the resultant. When the force of the impact is spent, he comes to rest, a self-contained globule of desire as before. This hypothetical person, commodity obsessed, asocial, one dimension, insatiable, rational, but in a way that any competent psychologist would qualify as insane, forms the bedrock of the neoclassical vision, the basis of its theory of value and hence its theory of markets and prices. It is the pure expression of a religious creed without parallel in any life science, the pseudophysics of particles imbued with will, redolent, as Veblen says, in the same essay of when nature abhorred a vacuum. To borrow a phrase from Keynes, it it's not only is nonsense, but it sounds like nonsense to any ordinary uninstructed person who wants to bothers to examine the matter with a fresh and open mind. To the economist, as my father put it, wants originate in the personality of the consumer. All economic policy in turn is geared toward maximum production. And this is justified by the urgency of those original insatiable wants. He wrote, were it so that a man on arising each morning was assailed by demons, which instilled in him a passion, sometimes for silk shirts, sometimes for kitchenware, sometimes for chamber pots, sometimes for orange squash. There would be every reason to applaud the effort to find the goods, however odd, that quench the flame. But not so if production only fills a void that it has itself created. In that case, one might wonder if the solution way, lay with more goods or fewer demons. With a vested interest in output, corporate capitalism resembles state socialism, but now the critical difference comes into focus. State socialism defined and generally met basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, according to patterns set by planners concerned in principle with input output efficiency. They were not particularly adept, for the most part, at managing a labor force, at distribution networks. They were not interested in the novelty of product design. Art, architecture, music, and film were not subordinated to the commercial world. Corporate capitalism recognized the prior necessity of framing wants, of designing products around which wants could be framed, of triggering the impulse of emulation, and of constructing a relatively narrow, focused, and effective production system, the corporation itself, which though necessarily large and integrated, did not face the cyclopean task of organizing production on the national scale nor of balancing every need against every other. Corporations coordinate in a simple way. They need only to grow as the same rate as all the others. A hyper successful corporation may grow faster, but only for a, a time. With somewhat decentralized units concentrating on specific industrial segments and coordinating on the growth of total effective demand, the problems of creating and meeting induced wants is solved in a robust way. But it is a way that exposes the hollowness of the entire social system that aggravates rather than resolves inequalities and hierarchies that is profoundly anti-democratic, predatory, and even totalitarian in its repression of those who advocate some other system. Henry Ford said the Model T could have any color so long as it was black. American democracy tolerates any social system so long as it is capitalism. 
but is a system that prospers only when resources are cheap, inequality is tolerable, and when the environmental costs may be safely neglected. The appeal of the affluent society to the critical spirit of the 1960s lay in providing a definitive demolition of the 20th century's leading efforts to disguise corporate capitalism as a system of free markets with sovereign consumers. It exposed the universal microeconomics as ridiculous and did so without recourse to Marxist polemic, to class analysis or dialectical materialism. While my father's approach to Marx was always respectful, it was never deferential. He writes, for instance, that if, quote, Marx had been entirely wrong, he would not have been influential. I suppose this attitude may have played a role in the non-publication of the affluent society in Russia, in Russian language, until this year. Otherwise, my father's works were published in the USSR and fairly widely read. In the United States, the leading current of radical economics consisted largely of Marxians who maintained methodological dialogue with neoclassicals and owed their academic survival to the latter's need to have a foil. Those radicals tended to maintain a wary, though respectful, distance from my father. He was, after all, a New Dealer and a Keynesian, an advisor and friend to Kennedy and to Johnson, and an intellectual threat no less to them than to the neoclassicals. Even though the, in academic disputes over hiring decisions in economics, he would always side with the radicals and sometimes paid a pretty stiff cost for it. There was never a radical push to create a permanent niche for Galbraith's disciples in academic economics, and no such niche exists or has ever existed. My father wrote that the affluent society was a window, and that this book, The New Industrial State, was the house. This book was drafted in the late 1950s, initially. The manuscript was stored in a bank vault uh, during the Kennedy years, which we spent in India. And then he got it out when he re returned in 1963, finished it up for publication in 1967. In the midst of the Great Society, the War on Poverty, and the War in Vietnam. Perhaps the peak year of American corporate power, of military hubris, of post-war prosperity, and social progress. It was also a moment when the American way had its peak reputation of the world, both as a model and a, a threat. Jean-Jacques Servan Schribert wrote and published Le Défi Américain, The American Challenge, that year, expressing the ambivalent mood. The Yankees had a superior corporate form, and it was going to take over in Europe. For economics, the new industrial state was a defining moment. It was the peak Galbraithian challenge. It expressed the imperative of placing organization on a plane above markets, for it was organization, ruthless, efficient, large scale, and only organization that permits the division of tasks required for the deep application of technology the long lead times required for product design, the management of specific demand so that sales can be assured and renewed, and the management of aggregate demand so that investment and scrapping plans can be coordinated. In general, organization permits comprehensive control of a planning system of corporate planets around which the rings of small and medium businesses revolve. For those who continued to insist on the small and medium business as the ideal type, my father expressed a kind of amused contempt. Quote, the person who sets to, out to study buildings in Manhattan on the assumption that all are alike will have difficulty passing from the surviving brownstones to the skyscrapers. And he will handicap himself even more if he imagines that all buildings should be like brownstones and have load-bearing walls 
while the others are abnormal. You have a similar phenomenon here in Moscow, I see with these lovely uh, New, New York style skyscrapers of a 21st century type. If you treat them as being the same as the uh, standard Moscow building, you're going to have a problem understanding architecture, it seems to me. The new industrial state described the American economy along with its power structures, mitigating and countervailing forces, and also its government and it, the military industrial complex as it was. The portrait is not on balance hostile. This is not Baran and Sweezy. It's not Bowles and Gentis. To Galbraith, to my father, the system had advantages and disadvantages, flaws and challenges. But the available alternatives did not include utopia achieved at low social cost. He was always the practical man. To him, realism and analysis presaged realistic solving of problems. He never believed in the day when all problems would be solved, when, as Irving Fisher had written in 1929, stocks would reach a permanently high plateau, or when, as Robert Lucas wrote in 2000, early 2000s, the economic problem of recession and the risk of depression would go away. It was sufficient to work toward the good, not even necessarily the great society, the good society would serve as a title for a later book. Toward that end, all practical measures should be deployed, including those with which the practical man had practical experience, which was the stabilizing regulation of prices and wages. So he did not believe that the price mechanism was the free instrument of the market economy. He believed that it, along with practically Everything else was part in the essential main structure of the economy of the planning system. And there's an interesting echo of this, interestingly enough, which has only just surfaced in studies that I'm familiar with uh, that reflects this view in the transition of China. Specifically, an understanding by the Chinese government that, the, uh, that specific prices had an extraordinarily important stabilizing role, both for inflation generally, but also for the confidence building or confidence destroying character of the economic dynamic. In the United States, the price of gas and the rate of interest play this role. In China, it's the price of rice and bread and cooking oil among the key prices. Rising prices, when sufficiently rapid to be perceptible, provoke runs, speculation, hoarding, and other disruptive and antisocial behavior. They also make it hard for government to sell debt, especially over the long term. They undermine confidence in the stability of the political system and of the economic system. This was fairly obvious through the Maoist period and afterwards. Uh, to, Ch to the Chinese. In American economics, where the price mechanism is left to the free market and the rate of inflation, to the tender mercies of the central bank, the monetarist dogma, this reality was not obvious at all. Or one should say that the point was willfully obscured, as it would be again in Russia in 1992, as American economists and economics were being imported wholesale. For my father, the need for stabilization of key prices was something that he had experienced personally in his role as director for prices in the Office of Price Administration, 1941-1942, and that never entirely left him in later years. And there was a day on August 15, 1971, when President Richard Nixon, a Republican and no fan of my father's, imposed price controls on the United States economy. The Washington Post called my father for his comment, and he said, I feel like the streetwalker who has just been told. Not only is her profession legal, but the highest form of municipal service. 
at a remove of 50 years, this is, I should say, the back cover of the original edition of the new industrial state. Uh, the uh, household uh, ascribed a caption to that photograph, which was, uh, as soon as it appeared, I heard someone in our household say that he was saying, get up off the floor, both of you, and put on your clothes. Uh, let's see what else I got here. Oh, yeah. It is not easy after 50 years to reconstruct or overstate the effect of the new industrial state. Nova industrial neobchiesto, am I right? Uh, on American political culture and its threat to the established economics. It was at the time the big book by the most widely read economist since the death of Marx. Speaking from a perch at the peak of academic prestige in the most powerful country of the moment. In an alternative universe, the economics profession might have simply folded up and followed John Kenneth Galbraith to the development of a new economics suited to the world of large organizations. It could perhaps have met his challenge with innovation along Schumpeterian lines, accepting the reality of large institutions and acknowledging their problems, but refusing the tools to address them. This would have been the fascist riposte. Or it could have doubled down on its fixed beliefs and simply deny that a material difference exists between the skyscrapers and the brownstones. What it actually did was that second course. The reaction of the economics profession and its leading figures to the publication of the new industrial state was ferocious. It was heavily attacked and dismissed, and no effort was made to come to grips with the self-evident realities that the book outlined and presented to a vast audience around the world. The economics profession instead went in the direction which it has, in which it has entombed itself over the past 50 years. This reaction was accompanied by a prodigious pretense, pretense to the status of science, a deepened commitment to impenetrable algebra, and a consequent attempt to read John Kenneth Galbraith, out of the economics profession, not really an economist. I have uh, just added here, I'm sorry that you can't see this. Uh, this is an original cartoon uh, by uh, William Hamilton of the New Yorker magazine from this period. And the, the caption says, well, sir, the boy is over John Kenneth Galbraith and ready to get to work. Gives you an idea of the view uh, that was taken at the time. Uh, in doing what it did, academic economics retreated to a neverland of obscure formal models, dogmatic policy rules, and intellectual incoherence behind which lurked lobbyists and paymasters. Monetarism, supply side economics, rational expectations came and went. And eventually the discipline closed in upon itself and ceased largely to interact with the outside world, leaving only its second tier representatives in public life to implement dogmatic policy rules that are locked into place. That is the story of a successful reaction to an intellectual force that was just too close to the reality of the world to be in, accepted by those whose responsibility it was uh, to interpret it. And there we are. I think a great deal of the difficulties that we've experienced in my professional lifetime over the last 50 years can be traced to the uh, successful reaction against the ideas of my father 
John Kenneth Galbraith. He, of course, went on. There he is late in life. And here is a little clay model of my father and my mother uh, in a posture, I have to say, that I never saw them uh, reading quietly in the living room together. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Professor, and now questions. Коллеги, я призываю вас активно задавать вопросы и думаю, что это будет не только крайне интересно, но и практически полезно для авторов вопросов. Потому что если в мое время дать понять преподавателю, что ты знаком с работами Гелбрейта, значит поднять свой авторитет в его глазах, то что уж говорить о вас когда автор вопросов потом на экзамене или на зачете скажет, а вот профессор Джеймс Кеннет Гелбрейт на мой вопрос ответил. Я думаю, это будет гарантированный зачет и плюс один балл на экзамене. Вперед, к микрофону, пожалуйста. Смелее. Зарабатывайте свои зачеты прямо сейчас в этой аудитории. So, uh, Professor Galbraith, yes. first of all, thanks for the speech. It was amazing, and we were we were truly delighted to listen to you. And it's a great honor to meet you. So, welcome to our university, and we'll hope you'll you. visit us once again. Mm -hmm. So, my question, I guess, is more related to the modern world and the current situation we have. So, we would love to hear your opinion on the trade war and probably what's the most possible scenario in the nearest future? Okay, uh, that is a very challenging question. And first of all, thank you very much for the very kind words. I really appreciate them. Uh, what is going on now, it seems to me, uh, is a very interesting application of state power uh, by the United States on a whole sequence of trading partners uh, and um, let's say uh, perceived, in some cases perceived adversaries. So uh, this is being applied, the tools are being applied to Canada, to Mexico, to China, and obviously to Russia. Uh, are they uh, proving to be successful from the standpoint of the American economy? I think the answer to that is yes, largely. Uh, that is to say uh, that uh, the American market uh, is, we've seen, very uh, crucial to most of our trading partners and most of the companies uh, who are affected by uh, either tariffs or sanctions uh, respond, or the threat of sanctions, uh, respond in ways which show that they appreciate that power. Uh, that is reinforcing, uh, first of all, the current inertial growth of the American economy, which is based upon household debt, credit card debt, student debt, other forms of rather diffuse debt uh, that have been sustaining growth for a long period of time already, and the rise in interest rates, uh, which is bringing capital back to the United States. So you have flight capital coming from much of the developing world, from Turkey, from Brazil, from Argentina, from South Africa, from elsewhere, uh, moving into the U.S. Uh, to take advantage of the higher interest rates and because of the, of the effect on exchange rates. All of this uh, is likely to support the growth of the American economy and therefore the political success of this administration, it seems to me. Over a longer run, I can't imagine that the world will not react at some point because it is a policy which is, in all of these respects, uh, I think the right word is predatory. That is to say, it's a policy which is putting uh, pressure on our trading partners and financial people, uh, countries that have open financial systems with respect to the US, 
uh, and uh, is going as that pressure gets stronger, they're going to start looking for other uh, ways of organizing their trading and financial relationships. It's clearly happening already with respect to China. You can see this to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and I say this as a former advisor to the Chinese government in the 1990s, actually. Uh, the Chinese have maintained enough control over uh, capital flows so that they have a degree of uh, insulation that other countries don't have. Um, so my guess is that while for the moment the US policy is working well from a strictly US perspective, that I do not think it will continue that way indefinitely. Uh, and you can clearly see the dissatisfaction, for example, of uh, the, chance, the German chancellor, right? uh, who uh, wants to deepen the integration of the Eurasian continent, wants to develop orderly trading relations uh, with, with Russia in particular, uh, wants to resolve, uh, to the extent it can be, the conflict in Ukraine, uh, and uh, is aggravated by the effect on German companies of the uh, US sanctions on Iran, which forced them out of their, their dealing with that country. So I mean, it's not, it's early days. A realignment hasn't happened, and may, one may be quite distant. But I don't believe that you can pursue a completely one-sided policy indefinitely without meeting, eventually, uh, a deeper institutional reaction. That would be my, my, my answer. Is that a reasonable answer to your, your question? OK, maybe then just maybe just to clarify sure. how, how to find this balance between like national interests, for example, national interests of the United States of America, and also the international well-being and well-being of other countries. Well, I think the, the, the post-war system um, had features from 1945 onward. Uh, but particularly from 1945 to 1971, uh, in which uh, the United States, in a very strong position initially, uh, accepted certain measures which limited the use of its, of, of its unilateral power. Uh, international financial institutions were intended in part to do that, but there were other, the other parts of the of the trading relations and of the what, what something called the scarce currency clause, uh, that were at least recognition that the that you that that the, the country at the center of the system had to act with some restraint. The attitude of the, our present administration is that restraint is not necessary, right? And there he's taking every advantage, and of course, he's getting a benefit from that. So I would say that the national interest, you can pursue it in the short run. Uh, but if you want to pursue the international interest, you have to take a longer view. And this is a conflict. You can't do both at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Colleague, you have a question? The microphone, please. First of all, I'd like to say that we really appreciate and we are really grateful for having you today. Thank you, really. And your father has invented the term conventional wisdom, as you have mentioned today, pointing out that conventional wisdom has actually always existed in any traditional society and thus should be taken seriously when pursuing any economic policy. So my question is, what are ways of dealing with or treating conventional wisdom in economic context from your point of view and whether your point of view differs from your father's stance? Thank you. Ah, does my point of view differ with my father's? Well, not today it doesn't, no. I, 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 <laughs> um, the, the concept of the conventional wisdom uh, was a phrase that he worked over and consulted with colleagues to make sure he had exactly the right phrase. And uh, they, this was a, uh, a little stroke of literary genius. Uh, and if uh, 
if I had a nickel for every time that phrase has been used since, I would be in, you know, in Warren Buffett territory if, uh, as far as the family wealth is concerned because it's just become a universal uh, reference. What does it mean? It means that there is, in any society, a body of, of, of um, respected thinking, right? which uh, you defy at your peril, at the risk of being considered eccentric, uh, at the risk of not having your voice heard. Uh, and the real trick of my father's work was that he was able to defy the conventional wisdom, but with a degree of wit uh, that uh, at a presence, of course it helped that he was six foot eight, the two meters tall, uh, that, uh, um, that he became, at least for this period, a, a voice that could not be and was not ignored. It was also part of his genius, I think, that he understood that he needed to reach the professors through the students. And when I was, a, when I was your age, uh, or a little younger, every college dorm room that I was in had my father's books in paperback. This was a bit depressing sometimes when I'd go out on dates and discover that, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, but it was his idea that the students would come to the pr professors and say, well, how come you're not engaging with this? What do you think about what Galbraith wrote? Right? And that was, uh, that was truly a subversive thing. It didn't make him popular with professors. Professors hate having other professors thrown in their faces. <laughs> uh, and you're, you consider yourself lucky that you didn't throw, I don't know, Joe Stiglitz or Paul Krugman at me on this occasion. I think. Um, the, uh, but at the same time, if you can pinpoint what is the conventional wisdom of the day, uh, and you know, and and poke a stick in it, you can always find that, that this is a very flawed view, that because it doesn't get to be the conventional wisdom unless it has been processed through a kind of second-rate intellectual uh, sieve. Uh, and it comes out, conventional wisdom is always a very kind of mushy thinking construct. So for ex you can come in American political discourse, uh, certainly in economics, the notion that we are a country of free markets is the quintessential conventional wisdom. And of course, examining the exact structure of the American economy or any economy establishes that it's not true. In the international sphere, the notion that a country is the indispensable nation, the, super, the sole superpower, the country that everybody else has to rely on, the, the, the leader of the free world or of the whole world, that's a similar kind of construct. I have to say one of the very last conversations I had with my father, and he was just short, just before his death, and I was in the hospital room, uh, and the doctors came in to a consultation and he was suffering from pneumonia, and terminal pneumonia. And he could barely talk, but he looked over at the doctors and he said, you're the finest medical team in what was formerly known as the free world. <laughs> yeah. I had to interpret that for them, but it was still uh, showed that up to the end, he never lost his wit. Oh, thank you very much. You have clarified everything. Thank Th you. Thank you very much indeed. Again, uh, many thanks for your lecture. And uh, uh, another question about China. What was the view of John K. Galbraith of the Chinese transition to the market economy in the late uh, 70s, 80s? Um, that's a good question. And I'm not sure that he developed much of a view beyond uh, a trip that he took in the mid-1970s, just after uh, the Kissinger and Nixon visits. Uh, which produced a small book, which I don't think holds up very well. It's called The China Passage. Uh, is the, the many things that were going on that we now know about were in the Cultural Revolution still very much uh, in process. Um, but the fact that he was on that trip 
along with, I think, Vasily Leontief and James Tobin, uh, is very interesting because it tells you something about who the Chinese were thinking of as relevant to their experience. Now, in the case of Leontief, it's not, it, Leontief, Leontief was not only a planner, but he was someone who had actually worked in China in 1929. He worked on the, on, the, on the sighting of the Chinese railroads, uh, went up in balloons and figured out where the line should go. Uh, but what I learned when I went to China in 1993, and I went to work uh, as a, an advisor to the State Planning Commission, for macroeconomic reform, technically. Really, it was a training mission. I wasn't a direct advisor, and I did, my advice to them was stay away from Western economists. They're not gonna do you much good. Uh, but I discovered that they'd all read my father. They all read my father, and uh, there's a very interesting brand new dissertation uh, by a young woman named Isabella Weber at Cambridge, uh, who has gone into this in great depth, and what they had read about him uh, from him was price control. Right? And what the Chinese understood was that the stabilization of prices uh, was crucial to the social stability. And this is exactly the opposite of what happened in Russia in 92. Right? They deregulated all the prices and the place went wildly apart. Uh, but in China, they had an exceeding sensitivity to prices. Uh, a little example that's in the dissertation that uh, relates to an, a, a uh, uh, a guy who was my tutor at Cambridge some years earlier, Adrian Wood, led early World Bank missions to China. Uh, and this was well before the reforms, I mean, the railway, uh, maybe just at the start of the reforms. And they had raised the price of high quality matches by a, a couple of fen, which is one one hundredth of a, of a yuan. And there was a run on the low quality matches. They disappeared as the stores. So they had to rescind the price increase. And my, my friend Adrian wrote in his diary, here we have a communist dictatorship that can't raise the price of matches by two cents. Right? As they understood that the stabilization of these things, even if there were, meant there were, that the supply was not necessarily going to stay, it was better to have a little shortage than to have a feeling that the, that, that the this sense of stability in what was still very largely a peasant uh, economy was being disrupted. And the Chinese caution on that obviously paid off. It obviously paid off in that it enabled them to make, over a long period of time, a very big transition, not socialism to market. That's not the crucial thing. So there were always markets in China. The crucial transition was from the countryside to the cities. It was from agriculture to light industry. And it was the solving of the problem of state socialism, which is to say how you get consumer goods that people actually want. And there was something very clever, maybe, I don't know how intentional, but very clever in the Chinese approach, which is they borrowed the standards from the West. So I said, okay, you can produce, you can produce if you can sell it to Walmart, sell it to Kmart, sell it to Target. You can also sell it in China, but if you can't, produce what, what, what the Western buyer considers adequate quality, then, then you're not, they're not gonna buy it. So the, 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 the firms that, that developed that production of capacity, that quality capacity, ended up being the firms that had uh, you know, the, the best uh, access, not only to the external market, but also to the internal markets. And you can see this in the way the Chinese consumer good industries developed. So, uh, Anyway, that's, that's, that's my take on the issue. I, I, I can't speak for my father because we didn't spend a lot of time talking, or at least if we sp talked about China in the 1990s, it was because I had something to say, not because he did. <laughs> that was rare, by the way, that that situation would develop. But. Okay, thank you for the answer. Thank you. Are you sure? Well, uh, thank you for the, your lecture again. I have quite a vital question. Uh, do you know if American government tends to cancel sanctions against Russia in the near the future? <laughs> um, I, can, I can give you historical precedent, which is that we imposed an embargo on Cuba in 1960 
and finally mostly got out of it in what, 2014 or so? So uh, you can look forward to this well into retirement, but I, I would advise you to keep working on it. Uh, it becomes extremely difficult once these things are in place, and particularly once they're nailed down by a hostile Congress uh, for the, even for a president who has a more uh, open view to successfully uh, overcome it. Uh, and, and, and it was true, by the way, in the Cuban case, that every, just about every president, uh, with the exception of the Bush, uh, Bushes, I think, uh, sought at one level or another a better relationship with Cuba. And they all found themselves frustrated by the political forces at place until uh, Barack Obama and John Kerry broke the logjam, and I think that had a lot to do with the, uh, uh, with the meeting between Raul Castro and President Obama at Nelson Mandela's funeral in South Africa. Uh, so, and also, I think also with the, maybe the aftermath of negotiations over, that led ultimately to the end of apartheid in the 1990s. But the, um, so I would settle in for the long haul, recognizing that the stronger uh, and the more durable and the more um, internally confident a country is, the more likely it is to be able to negotiate an end to this hostility, which we, at some level, will have to come, sometime, have to come to an end. Uh, you know, at the, let me give you another a rather profound personal observation on this. So, my father was a diplomat for a while. He was ambassador to India, 61 to 63. And we came back in May of 63. In October, he met with Kennedy. And Kennedy, my understanding is that Kennedy suggested to him that he might take the ambassadorship in Moscow. And the purpose of doing that would have been to end the Cold War. Because Kennedy knew very well where my father stood on the prospect of, uh, of, of getting a accommodation between the US and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, and, of course, Kennedy was killed within two months. Uh, and the Cold War went on for another 25 years. It was eventually ended by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. But it could have been ended 25 years earlier. But it's exceedingly difficult to uh, break a mentality and a set of perceptions that are now getting locked, that were locked in at that time and that are now getting locked in again. Yeah. So I would hope that there, there is as much person-to-person -person contact as possible and as much diplomatic engagement as possible uh, and as many, uh, as many efforts as possible to keep minds open and lines of communications open because it can be a very difficult period. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your uh, lecture, and um, I would also like to ask some uh, question, though it's not linked, uh, not uh, very linked, uh, connected to your uh, lecture. You know, when you told that your father opposed both Marxists and the neoclassical school, you reminded me of a question that occurred to me two or three years ago when I first started learning microeconomics. So my question is that nowadays uh, eco economical science is uh, striving to find an ideal formation between the market economy and the governmental socialism. I, th I personally think that ide something ideal does not exist because people are too scared of both total totalitarian regime and at the same time, they are too scared of an ideal market, for then there would be absolutely no control. In this case, uh, modern science, that is striving to find this ideal recipe, 
is uh, somewhat, well, at least useless. I suppose that maybe nowadays uh, uh, scientists should, economists should try to adopt, to find a way to adopt to changing circumstances rather than find some ideal solution. What do you think about it? That's very much uh, Galbraithian uh, uh, thought, and, and I, I fully, I'm fully sympathetic to it. Uh, the approach that was developed in the United States between the early 1930s and the 1960s, 70s, was, I think, properly, the success of that approach was owing to the pragmatic character of the people involved, uh, people who, in many cases, came from other countries. My father came from Canada. Leontiev came from Russia. Uh, Kuznets came from Belarus, from, from Minsk. Uh, there were uh, many people who had seen uh, a wide range of economic systems and dealt with problems at a high level of uh, technical um, uh, sophistication is not the word I'm looking for, but they had clear technical minds. Uh, they were looking for accounting frameworks and regulatory frameworks uh, that were fit for purpose. And the purpose was, first of all, to reconstruct the country following the Depression, and secondly, to organize the industry that existed and new industries uh, to uh, provide the industrial basis for winning the Second World War. And so they, as they moved into the 50s and 60s, they had a legacy of, uh, let's say, practical knowledge and experience, which they applied. Uh, and this was predominant. Uh, both before and after that period, we have ideology prevailing. And the ideologies uh, were, on the one hand, uh, the, what we call the classical or neoclassical economics, called free market equilibrium, the, the notions of Leon Valras uh, and his uh, colleagues in the late 19th century, or Karl Marx uh, and dialectical materialism, class conflict, and all of that. Uh, and in the aftermath, after about the 1980s in economics uh, and professional economics, a uh, kind of mathematical version of the neoclassical ideology returned. And the economics profession ceased to have any real bearing on the world, except as a matter of a few dogmatic principles, uh, which, whose origins are no longer even clearly understood, monetarism for it being an example, or the IMF formulas of deregulation and privatization. Why are they doing these things? They are impelled by narrow private interests, by and large. Uh, it's obviously great if you can acquire a state asset at a very cheap price, uh, if you happen to be the person acquiring it, not if you happen to be someone who needs that asset for some public purpose. So we're seeing the application of ideology, and it's, we're seeing the results of it. Uh, I do think that a revival of a practical and pragmatic approach becomes extraordinarily necessary when you have problems that have to be faced. P climate change is a problem that has to be faced. Uh, and the risk of war is a problem that has to be faced. And these are problems which cannot be resolved by people who have inflexible or dogmatic minds. Thank you. Так, коллеги, если вопросов нет больше, но мы не заканчиваем, мы давайте поблагодарим профессора и перейдем к заключительному этапу нашего, нашей сегодняшней встречи, к презентации вот этой книжки. Попросим провести эту презентацию господина Нагаева, научного сотрудника Института США и Канады, который наряду с Джоном Кеннедом, Гелбритом, Джеймсом Кеннетом, Гелбритом, академиком Никипеловым является 
одним из авторов этой книжки. И я хочу сказать, что э, после этой презентации мы попросим Джеймса подписать вот привезенные экземпляры. Часть из них пойдет в вашу библиотеку, а другая часть будет, как уже сказал ваш декан, использована для поощрения студентов. Спасибо, это очень интересная книга. Конечно. Коллеги, прошу не расходиться. Мы сейчас заканчиваем уже. Сейчас мы закончим. Значит, вашему вниманию мы предлагаем книгу, которая вот называется «Виражи и риски экономики будущего». Значит, о чем эта книга? Ну, буквально пару слов. Вот я скажу. Сейчас вы знаете, Россия значит, делает шаги в сторону построения высокотехнологичной экономики. Высокотехнологичной экономики, ну, которая имеет множество названий, включая цифровую экономику. Вы, наверное, это все слышали. Вот. В общем, экономика будущего. Но прежде чем создать такую экономику, вот прежде чем что-то строить, мы должны заложить идеи. Вы понимаете, сначала закладываем идеи, какие идеи мы закладываем в основу этой экономики. Но за идеями мы обращаемся к экономической теории. Правильно? Экономическая теория является поставщиком и генератором идей. Значит, мы идем к экономической теории, и тут у нас ожидает неприятный сюрприз. Она находится в кризисе. Экономическая теория находится в кризисе, вы, наверное, все слышали, это не мои слова. Вот сейчас оказывается, значит, глобальный экономический кризис 2008 года, он нанес мощный удар по экономической теории. Вот, например, журнал The Economist, так, посмотрите где-нибудь в архивах, если найдете, значит, The Economist, статья под названием «Красноречивая. Почему экономическая наука перестала работать?» заявил о бессилии современной экономической теории а, перед лицом кризиса 2008 года. Вот я цитирую, что он написал, вот дословно. «Из всех недавно лопнувших экономических пузырей громче всех лопнула репутация экономической теории». Добавлю, здесь очень уточ, уточнить надо, в кризисе находится не сама экономическая теория, а мейнстрим. Ну вы понимаете, то есть тот мейнстрим, который зародился в конце 70-х годов, и вот э, царствует, главенствует по сию пору. Вот он сейчас уходит. Мейнстрим уходит. Что приходит ему навстречу, э, э, как бы никто не знает. Вот на Московском экономическом форуме и в прошлом году, и в этом году этот вопрос дебатировался. И никто не знает, что приходит. Ну, нам что нужно? Нужно э, искать новые идеи. Как искать новые идеи? Значит, мы должны обратиться к наследию выдающихся экономистов. Ну, для начала, значит, это должен быть выдающийся экономист, бесспорно. Дальше, это должен быть наш современник, ну, чтобы он знал, э, чтобы знал, что происходило во второй половине 20 века. То есть э, Карл Маркс явно не подходит, Адам Смит тоже, они все старые экономисты. Вот. Ну, желательно, чтобы, это, чтобы экономист этот не был скован узами мейнстрима. То есть как бы вне мейнстрима он был, понимаете? Вот. Ну и третье, вот очень важное э, такое требование, чтобы он был не только теоретик, но и практик. Почему практик? А дело в том, что практик, он смотрит на, знаете, практик на теорию смотрит немножечко по-другому. Вы спросите, ну как это вот может соединяться в человеке и теоретик он, и практик? Ну согласитесь, либо практик, либо теоретик. Да? Вот. Но, тем не менее, есть такие люди, и вы понимаете, речь идет о Джоне Кеннете Гелбрете. Вот все, что я сказал, это все относится к нему. И выдающийся экономист мира. Вот, кстати, здесь можно вспомнить в этой связи, такой есть профессор экономической теории Калифорнийского университета в Беркли, его зовут Джеймс Брэдфорд Делонг. Вот он сказал... Если бы в мире существовала справедливость, это я дословно цитирую, если бы в мире существовала справедливость, то Джона Гелбрейта назвали бы самым влиятельным американским экономистом 20 века. Это действительно так. Он не был удостоен Нобелевской премии, непонятно по каким причинам, но вы знаете, что Нобелевской премии ее по экономике и не существует. Премия как называется правильно? Кто скажет? Вот, кстати, кто скажет, тот получит книгу. Как, как называется премия, которую мы называем Нобелевская премия по экономике? Премия имени Точнее. Кто сказал? Кто сказал? Памяти. Как вас зовут? Представьтесь, пожалуйста. 
Антон, ну подойдите, пожалуйста, к микрофону. Я скажу, что Нобелевская называется премия, поименованная в завещании Альфреда Нобеля. Их всего пять. То есть по физике, химии, медицине, там, мира и по литературе. А вот та, которая премия, совершенно правильно сказали. Вы из какого факультета? Мэо. Мэо? Да. Ну, сам Бог велел, как говорится. Антон, я поздравляю вас. Спасибо. Ну, читайте. Спасибо, что вы как говорится, с нами. Сейчас подойдите, Джеймс подпишет да. книжку по Давайте окончанию, память, чтобы он жел... подписал вам сразу. Желаю сдать сессию. Сессию желаю сдать. Вот. Ну, теперь скажу, что здесь в этой книге есть. Да. Так вот, Новый, мы хотим сказать, а вот что идет на смену новому, то есть старому мейнстриму, вот что приходит? И вот здесь приходят как раз и те и самые идеи, которые были заложены в трудах Джона Гелбрейта. И у них есть одно название, я не буду раскрывать, экономический прагматизм. Ну вы, наверное, слышали, вот сейчас это муссируется. Ну и действительно, старый мейнстрим, что он может, что он может дать? Тот старый, который по Хайеку, по Милтону Фридману, вы понимаете, он уходит. До этого был свой мейнстрим. Какой? Тот, который зародился в 30-е годы. Ну, вы понимаете, да? Вот. И сейчас вот 40 лет, 40 лет э, главенствовал тот мейнстрим, вот, который э, сейчас уходит. И все, он уходит. Теперь... Таким образом, вот идеи Джона Галбрейта, они очень здорово ложатся. И причем, что самое интересное, вот этот экономический прагматизм, вот, э, как говорится, э, есть мнение, что это, собственно, на основе его и будет, э, возникнет новая вот, экономическая теория. И что очень интересно, что Джон Гелбрейт стоял у истоков, по сути, вот, американской тех, э, вот той Америки, которую вот, мы знаем, вот та высокотехнологичная Америка, потому что база закладывалась в конце 50-х, начале 60-х годов при Кеннеди. Почему закладывалась? Ну, потому что тут много, тут много было очень проблем. Это и два кризиса в, в США в 50-е годы, 53-й, 54-й год, 57-й, 58-й год. Вызов со стороны Советского Союза, да? технологический вызов. Это и полет, и спутник, и атомные технологии, первая атомная станция которая у нас была в Опнинске, ну и, конечно, полет Гагарина, все это заставило Америку задаться вопросом, что делать. И поэтому, и вот на этот вопрос как раз ответил Джон Гелбрейт. Понимаете, вот он заложил основу. Не, не зря же он оказался, как сказал уважаемый профессор, он стал советником президента Кеннеди. Понимаете, да? То есть советник президента Кеннеди – это очень высокая должность, и вот даже был его спичрайтером, и некоторые тексты Кеннеди, это на самом деле тексты Джона Гелбрейта с пометками Кеннеди. Ну а теперь буквально вот об этой книге, буквально пару слов. Значит, содержание. Ну, Во-первых, мы благодарим профессора Джеймса Гелбрейта, который предоставил сюда в... Да, здесь... Здесь мы поместили работу Джона Гелбрейта, которая является таким ключом, таким гайдом, ну, которая как бы вводит круг, круг проблем, которые он изучал. Она называется «Экономика невинного обмана». Она уже давно стала библиографической редкостью. Те, кто знает, те знают. Вот. Но вы ее не ищите, она уже здесь, мы ее переиздали. Дальше. Профессор Джеймс Гелбрейт предоставил замечательную статью, которая называется «Какова американская модель на самом деле?». Вот это одна из лучших статей, христом, это уже христоматийная статья, но я не буду скрывать, она мне в свое время помогла, и, так сказать, была таким вот, хорошее слово, гайд, вот таким гайдом она для меня была. Вот. И профессор Джеймс Гелбрейт предоставил еще и вторую свою статью. Было бы очень интересно посмотреть нам на, со стороны вот, взгляд из России вот, на поднятые проблемы. Да? И мы поместили здесь статьи академика Никипелова, прекрасная статья вот, профессора Пороховского и других. И все это посвящено вот именно вот этим вопросам закладки нового фундамента, ну сказать, по сути, закладки нового мейнстрима.
Ну, потому что старые мастерим уходят. Ну вот, собственно, вкратце так об этой книге. Читайте Джона Гилбрейта, вам удачи. И желаю вам сдать сессию. Спасибо, Игорь. И, коллеги, давайте еще раз поблагодарим уважаемого профессора Джеймса Кеннеди. I, I, before you go, I want to share with you one small secret. Utilse ruskove jazika vrškolje. Eto bol mnogo ljeta mu nazad. I think they might have had an idea when I was in high school that I might use my Russian in a career in the foreign service, but it became clear that I was not suitable material, so I moved on. It's been a great pleasure talking to you, and I thank you very, very much indeed.